I'm here with Regina, and Regina is a mom of six, mm. youngest two are twins, who are in high school, the rest of um, our adult children, and uh, married to Derek for 23 years, mm -hmm. and we'll talk a little bit more about him in a minute. Um, first of all, you had your kids really close together. Yeah. Um, I think you said you had your first four uh, in, uh, in under five years, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. And then you had your twins when your oldest was not quite seven. Yeah, he had just turned seven. He had just turned mm -hmm. seven. So you had six kids, seven and under, Yeah. Um, which is crazy. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's fun though. So when you look back on that time, I'm sure some of it is just a fog, but um, but to be able to say that some of it was fun, <laughs> um, do you have yeah. anchors of tradition or family culture that kind of, what what's joyful that you remember about that time? How did you help yourself enjoy those moments? Oh, that's a good it? question. Like while you're in I think it. I just ate, asked like seven different questions, but <laughs> that's answer whatever you want. Oh, well, okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I really was, um, I think I wanted it, you know? I told Derek when we... Um, first started, so he grew up with his one brother, mm -hmm. uh, which was awesome. They're really close. They have a good, close family, and um, but he really loved the idea of having a big family. And I had grown up with five siblings, and so I thought this would be so fun. And when you're in school and you're like going full time and working full time and like so super busy, and and then I decided I want to stay home and be a mom. Like I'm not going to have kids just so someone else can raise them. I want to do it and. And so then I'm home and I'm sitting there with this one baby and I'm like, I feel like I'm just wasting my time. <laughs> I'm wasting my abilities, <laughs> you know, and which is so silly, but, um, but I just had just, just kind of everything just slowed down and I thought if I'm going to be home having kids, I might as well be home having kids. And so I thought, I just kind of want to get my team here. I want to see who I'm working with and just get them here yeah. so we can do the family thing. Cool. And so it was actually funny because we um, started saying, okay, well, yeah, it'd be good to have them close together. They could be good buddies and be a support to each other and they could entertain each other. And, and we should have another baby so they could be close together. And then they found out I was already like three months pregnant. <laughs> and then he came a month early and I'm like, yeah, that was pretty quick. Holy so God. once we did that and had those two kids so close together, I'm like, well, we might as well just, just keep going. Yeah, and yeah. it was super fun. and. That um, just the fact that they could play together. I felt like as long as I'm sitting on the floor playing with babies, we might as well have babies. And as long as I'm taking kids for a walk, let's just put them all on a wagon. I used to go with four kids in a wagon and just pull them all over our little trails in the Seattle area. And I just loved it. I thought it was fun. I, I was young and I had the energy to do it. <laughs> I couldn't do it now. <laughs> but it was good. So the twins, adding the twins to the mix was um, overwhelming, honestly. And I feel like that's when we learned to let people help us okay. because we, we lived in a, a community that was ready and able to help us. And people started saying, oh, when are our twins going to be born? And when are we having our twins? You know, the whole time I was pregnant. And everybody called them our twins. And it was super awesome to to just let people, at first people would come and say to Derek, hey, how can we help your wife? And he's like, no, we're good, we're fine. And I'm thinking, and so at one point I said, you're fine, I'm not fine. <laughs> I've got these four crazy little people and I just had two babies and I'm nursing them full time. Like, that's all I did was nurse babies right. for a while and I wasn't getting any sleep. And so to have people bringing in food or they would come and play with my older kids or take them to get ice cream so I could, I mean, like somebody would drop by sometimes just so I could get in the shower. They'd hold the babies so I could go get in the shower. Wow. <laughs> and it was crazy. And that, like you're talking about some things being a blur, that first year with those twins is kind of a blur. Okay, yeah. I look back on it and I just feel like, I survived that. Like, whoa, yeah. I don't remember it. <laughs> but I survived it, so I don't know. It was good. And then as, of course, they get older, you know, they're more independent and and I think it was actually really good that we um, had them close together. My kids laugh about how many times I would say things like, you know, you got this, you, you can do this by yourself. Because I really tried to train them to be independent because I was always, 
have had a baby. Yeah. <laughs> you know? You needed them. So I know. needed them to be able to do their own thing and so they were all very capable and but yeah, they kind of had that um, mentality that, well, we we can do this by ourselves and that's cool. And they're still very independent and I think that's good. It was a benefit. Yeah. A blessing that came from having them all close together. That's really neat. That's cool. That's unexpected. I wouldn't have guessed that right. <laughs> So you were, you mentioned this community that was of great help to you, especially for the twins. Mm -hmm. You lived far from home in Seattle and then in Colorado where you were within driving distance, but right. um, but still not still real not close to family. Yeah. So um, tell me a little bit about how you built a community of friendships around your family in a way that people were able to then step in and, and help yeah. when you needed it. <sighs> Well, I think I am a very um, out there. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I, I overshare probably <laughs> with people. So um, that's good for interviews. Oh, is it? <laughs> You'll get like I'm tired of talking to you. But um, I, I think because I just um, you know, if we went for a walk and we saw people in the neighborhood that had little kids. Um, we got to know them, chatted with them, and um, figured out where they lived. And we had little play groups that, you know, we meet. There was like we lived in a townhouse at first, and so there was a community clubhouse, and we had a little play group that would meet, you know, a couple times a week. And so we had that support system, mm -hmm. and then we also had our church support system, you know, that also was very cute about stepping in and helping, and um, that gave us a little bit more of the. Um, people that didn't have young kids. Mm -hmm. They had maybe older kids, which was super helpful to me because they became my friends and then they would say, well, let me send my my 11-year-old over to help you um, when you're getting the kids ready for bed or whatever. Or I have a 14, my two 14-year-old boys will come over and play with your kids while you're um, you know, doing whatever. And so I got a lot of those older kids that were my friends' okay. kids that would come and help a lot, which was really great because a lot of our younger friends, they were so busy with their own kids, you know? Sure. Um, so yeah, I think, I think I've, I've learned over the years, you know, um, and from that example I shared earlier about Derek just being like, no, we got it because we are pretty independent and we wanted to be able to do our own laundry <laughs> and our own floors and stuff, you know? But, um, but I think if people call me and they say, what do you need help with today? And I'm saying, oh my gosh, I haven't done laundry in like two weeks, you know, because I hadn't, and and I it's hard for me to lie about stuff <laughs> and pretend. So I think because I overshare, because I'm like I'm not keeping up. I'm, you know, that people. I was very willing to if somebody said, well then let me come help you with your laundry. Mm -hmm. I was like that would be so great. And I just let people do it. And I know for me, there have been times when I have wanted to help somebody. Like you have a desire. You see, especially because you have empathy for people who are going through things you've been through. Sure. And so I see that. I see somebody going through, you know, it's not like having twins is a trial, but going through something like that. And and I think I, sh I know I should know how to help them. Mm -hmm. Like I've been through that same situation. But... Um, but if you have somebody that's a little more private and not as willing to tell you what they need help with, or it's hard to, for me to guess. Sure. I am not good at it, and I want to help, but I just don't want to get in their way, and I don't want to step on their toes, right. and I worry about offending or get sensitive. Being sensitive. Yeah. yeah, and so I, I appreciate when somebody will say, ah, oh, if you could run to the store for me, that'd be so great, and. I'm so happy to go to the store for them because I want to help and I want to know what really would help them. And right. so I think because I've been in that spot, I, as as we've had other trials as years have gone on, I think that I've been just pretty open with what I need because I know that people want to help. Right. And when people help me and I allow them to help me, I mean, those are my strongest friendships. I consider those friends my family to this day because they're the ones that came in and have helped me with so many things, you know? Mm -hmm. And you get so close to them because they are taking care of you and 
And I think that would be so sad if I didn't ever open myself up and say, I actually could really use help with this. Yeah. You know, then I wouldn't have gained those friendships. So for sure. So I'm a believer in being open <laughs> with what I need help with. Yeah. So that and just letting people in. I love that. Yeah, being able to be vulnerable in order to yeah. create relationships. That's yeah, it's really not powerful. like you really want people doing your laundry, right. you know. Right. <laughs> no. But but I love like I have so many memories when I look back and just think of you know this cute friend who would get her kids to bed at night and leave them with her you know her husband sleeping and she would come over because my husband worked late and she would come and just help me get those twins to bed at night and when they were fussy and crying and we had these great chats and for me to have another adult after being with all my little kids all day and yeah, adult, you know, conversation adult conversation and, huge, and, yeah. and I just thought it doesn't matter if my house is a total disaster like to have Tracy here talking with me is so helpful and yeah. rocking a baby and anyway those are like tender memories for me so I'm grateful that I let people do that I let him in to help me. So. Cool. Oh, that's so powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. That's cool. Okay, your husband Derek was diagnosed with colon cancer. Yeah. And um, and you lost him about two and a half years yeah. ago, I think. Is that right? Yeah. Um, just before your twenty third wedding anniversary. Yeah. And there were five years in between the initial diagnosis. And, uh, and his death. So tell me a little bit. There was some remission, I think, yeah. in that period. Mm -hmm. um, but he, um, tell me a little bit about savoring that time mm -hmm. and um, really, really investing in that as a family and mm -hmm. um, and helping your children invest in that time while he still held a job yeah. and you guys moved and right. there was still a lot of life going on. So. Yeah. Tell me about those yeah, five years. Because you just don't you just don't stop your life. You right. know? Your life is just gonna keep happening. And even if you know, it's not like we're perfect parents or that we were perfect at communicating with each other or that we were, you know, none of our relationships are perfect. And it's not like all of a sudden you like, oh we've got this terminal illness now. Now we'll be perfect in right. our relationship. Now we'll show love at every moment and now we'll never get frustrated with each other or um, lose patience or whatever. You still do because it's real life and you still have those same, you know, human tendencies or whatever. And yeah. so it's not like we magically just everything became this like blissful, peaceful, you know, we still had conflict and we still had things we had to work through. And, and um, one thing that was a little bit tricky for, or for us um, as a couple was that he was very um, self-disciplined and very determined and was able to really kind of do anything he wanted to do, you know? And he took good care of his body and he um, worked really hard at everything he did. And I think in his mind it was like, I can conquer cancer because I am determined to conquer cancer, yeah. you know? I'm gonna be healthy. And, and it wasn't ever supposed to go into remission and it did. And so it was like, well, I received this miracle and I'm just going to assume that forever after I will live a long normal life but in the back of my mind I kept thinking okay this is awesome and amazing and I'm so grateful that he's healthy and that he's in remission and that he's strong and capable and but I always in the back of my mind thought it could change at any month any minute like we could go in every three months, he'd go in every month and have blood work done and then every three months to have a scan because they fully expected it to just pop back up, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, and every time we'd go in, I was just like, They're gonna, what if they find something? They could find something at any of these appointments, you know? And so I spent a lot of time during that, like five years, um, like I told friends, I cried in the shower, like every time I was in the shower. Because that's the only time that you're like totally by yourself mm -hmm. and you know we put on our happy face and this is so great that you're in remission and um and that we've got this extra time but it was always in the back of my head like i might have to watch you die you know and i might have to watch my kids lose their dad and that's gonna be hard and i don't want to do it and um 
And so it was interesting because I think I grieved that cancer for those full five, five and a half years. Yeah. And then when he finally died, it was kind of almost like I don't cry in the shower anymore, <laughs> which is so weird. And I've thought about that a lot over the last couple of years. Like, I don't cry in the shower. But I think that I just like the anticipation of I'm not going to have this forever um, was hard. But also, like what you're asking, also helped me to just really appreciate him and just be grateful he was here. And to be grateful that he was making money for our family, you know, grateful he could hold a job. I was grateful for the time he had to strengthen relationships with our kids. Because if he had passed away those five years sooner, our kids were so young, but he got to see them kind of, you know, he saw three of them graduate from high school, go to college, and, and um, got a lot more time with those younger twins. They were nine when he was diagnosed with cancer, so um, they were 14 when he died, and I was grateful for that. You know, that they know him, they'll remember him better. And and I always kept thinking, this is why we had our family so close together. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because they are all old enough, you know. If we were still having babies, I mean, because he was diagnosed in his 30s, so if we were still in those baby years, I wouldn't, I'd have these little, little kids that didn't know their dad, you yeah. know. So I'm grateful that we had our kids <clears throat> quickly and got them all here, and we had lots of time together. And it allowed us to just make sure that we we built memories together, you know. We took a lot of great trips as a family, like to the whole family. And he and I took trips together as a couple. Um, there was one trip that I kept thinking, if he, so right after he was diagnosed, um, he had always our whole life said, I think Hawaii is overrated. <laughs> and I was always like, but I really want to go to Hawaii. <laughs> and he's like, but everybody always talks about Hawaii being awesome, and I just think it's overrated. Like, there's so many better places we could go. <laughs> and I'm like, how do you know it's overrated? We've never been there, you know? Yeah. And so that was one of the things after he was diagnosed with cancer that he said, all right, we should go to Hawaii. Oh. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And he said, should we wait for our 20th wedding anniversary? And because of that, like, always in the back of my head thinking, this could change at any minute. I yeah. just didn't want to wait for anything. Yeah. I was like, I don't, I mean, that's a year and a half from now, but I'm not waiting for that. Like, you might not even be here, or you could be sick, right. or, you know, and he, in, in his mind, he would say, no, I'm fine. I'm going to be here. It'll be fine. And I think, but you can't promise that, you know? So there was always this little bit of a, I didn't want to be the downer. Sure. You know, because he was super optimistic. But at the same time, I felt like I have to be kind of realistic about it. Because that's a potential thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we went to Hawaii, and we just enjoyed every minute of Hawaii. And he decided it wasn't overrated. It's was just as great as everybody <laughs> said. <laughs>